Okay, it's uh, my pleasure to introduce our second speaker for today, Marin Genov from the Institute of Mathematics and Informatics, who will talk about functions holomorphic over finite dimensional commutative associative algebras. Thank you, Antonio. Uh, first of all, thanks to the organizers for making this uh, great event uh, happen for the second year in a row. And of course, for inviting me to participate in it. Um, today, I would like to tell you about um, favorite little um, topic uh, of mine, as well it's been a personal favorite for a while. Um, that concerns the so-called uh, functions homomorphic over finite dimensional commutative associative unit of algebras. So it's a bit of a mouthful, so I'm just going to refer to these objects as algebras. And, uh, and if there are any deviations from this convention, I will state this explicitly. Um, and so the outline of today's talk is of course to introduce uh, the main ideas of the theory, uh, then to look at uh, some local aspects of the theory and then gradually build up uh, our way into more global uh, ideas and notions. Uh, right. Um, so uh, so uh, for this talk I'm going to borrow a term from, from German, uh, Funktionen theory. So for those who do not know uh, German, this actually stands uh, for the study of complex differentiable functions of uh, single or sometimes several complex variables. The usage actually varies throughout the um, uh, German literature. Uh, it's a very, it, it's really a ascending term. Um, and it's kind of appropriate uh, for this song because here uh, we are going to kind of have both a single variable and several variables at the same time. Um, so what, what's a, What's the starting question here? Um, and then we, so if you look at the definition, so we are all familiar with the definition of complex differentiability. Uh, the question is, can we replace the algebra of complex numbers, say, uh, say matrix algebra, uh, by another finite dimensional commutative associative unit of uh, algebra A? And of course, before we even ask this question or uh, attempt to answer this question, uh, we have to examine if, if there are actually any non-trivial examples. And indeed, there are non-trivial example, examples. The category of uh, such algebras, be it real or complex, is non-trivial. Here's an example of a, of a, a six-dimensional um, K-algebra. In fact, it's a, it is a local uh, algebra. And moreover, also the morphisms of such algebras can be non-trivial. Here is a projection, so, so it's uh, onto the quotient of this algebra A onto a five-dimensional um, also local algebra. And so uh, it is a, a nice category with uh, uh, some uh, interesting objects and uh, some more interesting morphisms too. Uh, and uh, so, uh, fun fact maybe, um, which is not um, exactly obvious, um, um, that already in um, dimension, in complex dimension 7 and higher, we get infinitely many isomorphism types of such algebras. And in terms of representation theory, it's, uh, I'm being told, it also belongs to the, uh, to the class of wild problems. Right, uh, so uh, let's, let's go back to the fundamentals. Uh, we, we need to give a, uh, some definition. Course, and we can uh, simply appropriate the definition from the complex analysis of a single variable. So we take uh, open subset of the algebra uh, and uh, a function from this open subset to the algebra is called a differentiable if uh, the familiar differential portion uh, exists as a limit. In limit. Of course, we, we have to be careful that um, h approaches 0 through the invertible elements of a. Right, so that actually uh, this portion is well defined. And this actually works because a uh, group of units of the algebra is an open dense subset of the algebra. Uh, but if you're not happy with this definition for their reasons, uh, one can equivalently uh, define uh, a differentiable functions uh, in terms of Fréchet differentiability, where the linear operator that approximates, uh, that approximates the, the function in the first order is given by multiplication uh, with an operator from the algebra. Right, so, so it's kind of an inner pressure differentiability. And both definitions are uh, equivalent. The one direction is kind of obvious. The other is very much not obvious, if, if you write it down. So it takes uh, uh, quite a bit of work, actually. Right, and so what happens if we, if we collect so, all these a differentiable functions? We, we have 
a notion of uh, differentiability, and so we do have a notion of homomorphicity, namely uh, a function is a homomorphic at a point if it is a differential in a neighborhood of the point. So uh, nothing uh, crazy. And if we if we collect all these functions, we do get a sheaf of A algebras with a distinguished derivation, the derivation of, of course being taking the A derivative of this map. But uh, we do actually want more from our functional theory uh, because we do want to imitate um, the, 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 the success of the classical complex analysis of single variable. We do want it to be a one variable theory, whatever that means, um, and that exhibits uh, some more broadly defined um, properties, namely the presence of some form of generalized Schirimon equations, uh, some form of uh, one variable. Cauchy Morella uh, integral theorems, so one variable Cauchy integral formula, one variable analyticity, whatever that means to be determined. Okay, uh, okay. and uh, so before we um, even attempt to construct um, uh, such, a, such a theory, um, uh, there, there are some clear obstructions, and uh, the first Obstruction is uh, the presence of unit of the algebra because, uh, and this is uh, one of the reasons why it's actually more convenient to uh, assume the algebra to be unital. Uh, namely, uh, if if uh, well, if it does not have any unit, the identity fails to be a differential for trivial reasons. Uh, so not very convenient. Uh, there is a second obstruction, uh, so more subtle. But if you tinker a little bit. Uh, with, what, with all these properties uh, that you want. Um, so uh, what does it mean to have a one variable integral formula? We kind of need to make sense of uh, integrating um, um, the um, A value, the differential one form, dz over z, over one cycles. And so this integral is corresponding to take values in the algebra. And so there is a clear uh, topological obstruction. The group of units has to be connected, or not connected. So it's equivalent to the same thing. Um, and a little lemma tells us that this is the case if and only if uh, the algebra carries a compatible complex structure. And so from this point on, I'm going to assume that the algebra is a complex algebra. And having now down all these par parameters, um, the commutative algebra tells us actually quite a lot about uh, these algebras. Uh, so by virtue of finite dimensionality, this algebra is an Artinian algebra, and so it decomposes as a finite direct sum of local Artinian algebras. Uh, and so, uh, in fact, for the purposes of doing some analysis uh, over, over, uh, over such algebras, it suffices uh, to assume that the algebra is, uh, uh, in fact, a local with some maximum idea of M and residue field C. And uh, in fact, the, the local algebra itself decomposes as a direct sum of the residue field and the maximum idea so in terms of vector spaces, only not as algebras. Uh, and so every element of A has uh, like, um, splits into two parts, uh, one part, so the scalar part, so to speak, and the important part X. And at this point, I should have said also that uh, of course, all elements of M are neopotent, but uh, M, the idea of M itself is also neopotent. Um, right, and uh, I'll shortly give a just, just justification for the spectral part, where, where this comes from. Um, so inside this decomposition, um, one can also identify the group of units as a subset, again. Uh, namely, those elements that have non-zero non scalar part. And here's where the, the, the name spectral part comes from. So um, it turns out that um, uh, such uh, commutative algebras, so finite dimensional commutative algebras, so the complex numbers are simply uh, isomorphic to upper triangular, or if you prefer lower triangular um, matrix algebras of this form. Of course, not all upper triangular uh, algebras of this form are going to be commutative. Um, and so, if we th think of operator of A as a uh, algebra of operators, uh, the, the scalar part is simply the eigenvalue. <coughs> and there is the finally, last but not least, there is a cube label commutative diagram. Um, so uh, um, this this projection onto the spectral part of of, uh, of the matrix or of the element of scalar part is of course a ring homomorphism and into the residue field of the algebra, and it is fact. In fact, a uh, retraction with respect to the natural inclusion, and th this little di diagram actually determines much of the interplay between the classical complex analysis of a single variable and uh, our uh, potential uh, functional theory. 
Right, um, and so uh, we, we have defined what it means to, uh, to be an A derivative, and uh, first, the first natural question is what is the relationship between the A derivative and uh, uh, well, in a, in a top of the derivative? And if we fix a complex basis of A, of a and consider a regular representation of the algebra, so if you have a equal or a differential uh, of a function, uh, that then the regular representation of the derivative is simply the complex Jacobian. And at this point, one can actually prove uh, a very special case of the Jacobian conjecture, uh, namely if we have a regular map uh, Cn to Cn um, that has a uh, linear uh, differential, or in other words, it's apomorphic. And of course, satisfies the Jacobian condition that the Jacobian has to be invertible as a matrix of polynomials. Then, in fact, uh, this uh, polynomial map is bilinear. Okay, so let's dive into the Wackel theory. Um, right. If we, if we fix a complex basis for the algebra, we can of course determine the structure tensor, and we can write down the components of the variable Z and of our function f. And then one can state uh, so. Uh, I can perform a bit of a, a change of variables uh, and can state a uh, uh, generalized form of the Cushy-Riemann equations in terms of the tensor and uh, the partial derivatives. And then we have uh, not uh, unexpected that the um, first derivative is the partial derivative with respect to the first variable. And note that, in a, so what's actually kind of important is that I've chosen the, the first basis to be the unit. The first basis vector to be the, the unit of the algebra. Uh, so at this point, one can pose a bit of a inverse problem. So to, to what extent can one recover the algebra from the sheaf of a differential functions? And there is a, there's an answer to this uh, uh, question. So if, if we have a, um, a homomorphic uh, function, um, and, and if we have, uh, so if, if it satisfies this additional condition, then we saw uh, if, if, we, if we can find n points in the open subset U um, such that um, the Jacobian um, matrix of F, when evaluated at these points, produces n linearly independent matrices in M and C, uh, then the structure tensor can be recovered from, from the Schrödinger equations of F. And furthermore, uh, if A contains a non-zero uh, square, then um, this sheaf always contains, uh, so for every open U contains such an F. And of course, condition two is automatically uh, satisfied when A is a unit of algebra. But in, in fact, this, this lemma is also uh, true for uh, non unital algebra. So, if you consider the analogous, uh, the analogous uh, notions for non unital or even real. Uh, and the glory of this is that if we have two, if we have two algebras, now if we have two algebraic structures on, on the vector space Cn, and if you have a, a, a function that is both simultaneously a homomorphic and b homomorphic, uh, and satisfies the above condition, so that uh, the dimension of the span of the image, which you call it, is n, then uh, these uh, algebra structures are necessarily isomorphic. In fact, I guess we could say equal because uh, uh, they're uh, also on the same set. Uh, right, and so talking about differentiability, uh, let's have a look at integrability. And so we call it an integrable if f has a, a, a primitive, right? Uh, or uh, simply a, a differentiable antiderivative. And to answer so to understand integrability, there is a small uh, but uh, very crucial lemma here that tells us that if f is a homomorphic, then the, the associated a valued uh, one differential form of f is del closed and has also d closed. Uh, so one consequence of this, one consequence of this, is a generalized form of Shibuya integral theorem. So if you have an apomorphic function and if you integrate over uh, one boundary, then the integral vanishes. And now, now think about uh, the fact that we are not we are no longer in the complex plane, but we are in higher dimensions. And so one consequence of this is uh, not uh, entirely unexpected. Um, there is of course stark contrast to the complex plane. If you take some 
well, some, some domain in this high dimensional space and uh, you remove uh, you remove a closed wall from it, it does not reduce the class of uh, integral functions on this, right? Because in the plane of course in the complex plane, if you remove, if you remove even a single point, then it uh, so, uh, completely changes what you can integrate. Uh, but this is not unexpected. I mean, this, uh, we already know this from Hartle system theorem. Uh, but of course, this is a simpler uh, proof in this special case. Right, and uh, so uh, another thing that we need is a notion of an index and this algebra. And uh, the index actually is defined in uh, pretty much the same way. Uh, as long as, of course, the integral on the right-hand side is well-defined. So, because, uh, uh, well, we have a non-trivial group of units in the general case. Uh, of course, the, the nominator has to be well-defined. So, the cycle, so shifted by z0 has to be in the invertible uh, elements of the algebra uh, for this to make sense. Uh, and if we take again our spectral uh, projection, um, it of course induces uh, map on the one cycles. And furthermore, if we uh, take the equivalence class of Z0 in the residual field, which is uh, so we won't just think of it as a point in the complex plane, but as a thin subspace of A, um, uh, then uh, this index is in fact well defined with respect to the equivalence class and can be computed in terms of uh, the usual index in the complex plane uh, as the index of the spectral part of the one cycle um, around uh, the, the eigenvalue of, of, of points. And it's of course an integer which we already know. And there is a corresponding, well, I don't want to say homology theory in the strict sense, in the strict sense of everybody. Uh, topology, uh, but there is a uh, homology that is uh, closely related to this index and that will uh, uh, have application for a little later. So basically, uh, uh, I, I call it spectral homology for, for, for lack of better wording, there's maybe a better term for this, uh, but it just, uh, the, it is simply the, the quotient group of the um, one cycle homology of these one cycles in you that are uh, spectral boundaries. Right, and uh, so now armed with this index, this notion of index, one can uh, establish the existence of a reproducing kernel. Uh, so, which is what the, the traditional Cauchy's integral formula tells us. So, if we have an apomorphic function, uh, let's say apomorphic over, um, let's say, a polydisc around point z0, then, uh, if, uh, then the expected formula actually holds. And as long as, of course, once again, the integral on the right-hand side is well-defined. So we're taking some simple loop in this polydisc and such that when shifted uh, um, about uh, zero, uh, as, as at, uh, zero uh, it is invertible. Um, and a little bit, so a little, little bit of work, this actually implies now the rather interesting um, consequence that uh, the the values of f, so, so the values of f on, on the curve, so because we are in high dimensions, not just in a complex plane, right? Uh, we are in high dimensions. The values of f on, on this curve gamma determine f uh, on an unbounded, unbounded set. And uh, moreover, this actually uh, this uh, um, uh, formula allows us to establish a form of analyticity. Um, so more generally, uh, one can uh, state the Cauchy transform for such algebras. Uh, so there's basically a producing kernel, not just reproducing kernel, but producing kernel to, to get new homomorphic functions. Um, and how do we do this? Uh, we, we fix a measurable space, omega, and uh, if mu is a finite a-value measure on omega, and uh, 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 G is a measurable function, and you open such that we have some control, some control over the spectral and the new open parts. And it's a kind of a funny, funny control because we are looking at the distance between the distances. So uh, it's kind of a uh, funny thing to have. But then this function is uh, so this integral is not only uh, uh, well defined. So I don't here, I don't have to make here this additional. I don't, uh, 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 additional convention that it has to be well defined. It is when this condition is satisfied. Uh, it's, it is not only well defined, but it defines an a-analytic function on you. This means uh, that uh, uh, 
uh, it can be expanded as convergent power series with coefficients in A. And the derivatives are given in the much the same way. And so this is, uh, of course, uh, uh, Cauchy's integral formula. It's a very special case of this. And so we get that uh, if uh, uh, f is an apomorphic function at 0, it can be, well, this is a bit of abuse of notation. If you forgive me. Uh, then f can be expanded as a convergent power series with coefficient of a. And we do have uh, here a somewhat interesting ring of convergent power series with coefficients in a. So, uh, of course, analyticity, uh, 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 the next question is, well, what's the convergence behavior of such power series? And one can define the analytic radius much in the same way. And uh, here's, uh, so here's what, uh, so here's the description of this behavior. It turns out that F is uh, what we normally convergent uh, on, on a pole. But not just any ball on a spectral ball, on the spectral ball on the algebra. So basically, this is uh, this is in fact a cylinder. So these are all elements of the algebra such that uh, have uh, such that uh, their spectral radius is less than r. And this is just so this is as a subset just a cylinder. This is just the uh, disk times the maximum idea. So just literally a cylinder. And moreover, this f is actually divergent outside of the outside of the spectral closure. No statement uh, on the boundary behavior at this point. And, and it's, uh, so there are two proofs. The original, there is uh, one proof by Ketchum, uh, 28, uh, and uh, another proof by me some 90 years later. Uh, and it's, it's a funny uh, thing that the, so, uh, uh, well, one would, of course, the first attempt would be to somehow translate the original proof from the complex plane to the algebra. But this does not work because in high dimensions, so for high dimensional Banach algebras, you only get submultiplicative norms. You, don't, you do not get the absolute value. In fact, the only norm the algebras, so the only, uh, 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 ups, uh, so the only algebras with proper absolute multiplicative absolute value are the, the reals, of course, the complex numbers, the, uh, the quaternions, if you allow non commutativity, and the uh, octonions, if I'm not mistaken, if you allow non associativity. So, uh, yeah. Um, and it's kind of an obstacle, but it, it works nonetheless. And also, this result is not true if we if we let uh, if we uh, drop commutativity. It does not work. Uh, right. And uh, the consequence of analyticity is um, so two types of uh, converse results. Uh, so the first one is uh, kind of the integral model. Uh, the first convert uh, so the converse result that if if f is uh, so continuous and vanishes uh, for all, let's say, piecewise uh, uh, smooth simple uh, curves. So we can negotiate on the regularity of the MI for one. Uh, so if these integrals vanish, then it is apomorphic, um, just like in a complex uh, plane. Um, and there is another version which I dubbed uh, differential model, so because it's a kind of differential converse. Um, if you remember, I said that if f is uh, apomorphic, then the associated form differential form is diclose. And here we have the converse that if it is uh, diclose, then it is also, this function is also apomorphic. And so we, uh, fr from this point on, one can start to build up a little bit of global theory. Uh, not much, but uh, a little bit at least uh, today. So um, this, this uh, analyticity actually allows us to establish a canonical form. For for, this, uh, for such apomorphic functions, and the consequence is that uh, basically you can, in, a, in some way, you can split f into a special part, a new part, and part. And this uh, simply because, well, uh, simply because uh, this idea is the maximum idea is new part, and you can uh, you can expand at uh, z, and then a little bit of uh, 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 so identity principle analytic continuation argument actually is that this is global as far as well, as much as possible, right? And this has uh, for some consequences. One can um, so we, we need uh, two auxiliary notions actually at this point. Uh, so the first one is the spectral closure. This is simply if we take a subset, we take the eigenvalues and uh, then we uh, take a Cartesian product with the maximum idea. So basically. 
we produce a cylinder that contains the cylinder that contains the subset and the special topology on a simply the um, topology um, given by uh, the spectral closures or the cylindrical closures of the um, open subsets in the analytic uh, topology. So it's kind of a cylindrical topology on, on, uh, on A. And of course, because sigma is projection, so on open map, we have, in fact, the strictly coarser topology. And uh, so uh, this, this allows to characterize the structure shifts a little bit. Um, so I'm going to give an interpretation for these uh, isomorphisms. Uh, so the, the first is another rare property you don't see very often uh, exactly this property that the, the inverse image of the push forward is uh, isomorphic to the original. And there is also a, a second property and you can combine them. Uh, ah, okay. uh, and you combine them and so what's the interpretation of, of the, the first uh, so of this uh, of, uh, first isomorphism? Basically, it, it means that if you have an achomorphic uh, function f, it extends automatically to the achomorphic function on the symmetrical closure. And so, unfortunately, uh, my sheaf of achomorphic functions only detects this spectral topology, this symmetrical kind of topology. And the second isomorphism is realized by these maps. Uh, so, this is which we've already seen <laughs> before. And so, if we, uh, if, uh, we uh, use this, uh, it turns out that these uh, these are multiplicative and uh, so well defined multiplicative and preserve the uh, derivation and so oh yeah this is a little hidden but basically uh, the sheaf of equomorphic functions is a realization of finite dimensional functional calculus right operator calculus uh, but not just for homomorphic functions, but for a-valued homomorphic functions. So basically we take a-valued homomorphic functions with values with a and we, well, uh, to put it blankly, we substitute uh, the variable a into a. Uh, in other words, what, what, here ha what happens here is that uh, we intertwine the, um, uh, the, the complex of variables of single, uh, so, so the, 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 the yeah, a complex analysis of a single variable with uh, with uh, multiplications in uh, new potent finite dimensional new potent algebras. So there's it uh, in no way. And another consequence, of course, is that we have an a b homomorphism. This extension, so this extension extends itself to to. to Everything related to them. So, in general, of course, the tensor product of fields need not be a Walker ring, the, or even the tensor product of four clocks. So, in particular, the tensor product of four clocks need not be a Walker ring. But what we get is so, of course, the, the power series thing is going to be an Euclidean Walker ring. A algebra with uh, maximum geo generated by MT as your field seal. But of also, the, 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 the ring of convergent power series with coefficients uh, in A is uh, an Euclidean Walker algebra. Uh, with this maximum ideal, and so uh, when we e equip um, an open subset of you with the restriction of the sheaf of homomorphic functions, we get the Walkley ring space with Neuterian stalks. And the two is, of course, so point two is, of course, the, the, the more important here statement, and uh, it's the analog of the Neuterian property from the complex plane. And it, in fact, follows from A because A is finally uh, generated over C, so basically just by tensoring. Uh, another consequence of the canonical form is, uh, well, uh, if you look at the definition of a homomorphic functions, you can 
where and the, the structure of algebra, we of course in these algebras we have uh, non-invertible elements other than zero. You get other non-invertible. So the natural question is, what happens if we let H uh, uh, go to Z and to an, uh, approximate another non-invertible element other than zero uh, in, in this definition? And in fact, it turns out that this actually exists. And uh, it's not only uh, not only does it exist, but it's uh, really crucial to uh, to prove um, the homological <coughs> version of the integral formula over A. And here it is. Um, so and the precise statement is that f is a homomorphic function, and uh, gamma is a spectrally no homologous uh, cycle. Then of course this integral vanishes, but moreover we uh, we get this reproducing kernel property over not just over some curves, but over uh, general cycles, uh, well, one cycles. And uh, so the similar result was proved by Giovanni Battista Rizzo in 1952, uh, but only for no homologous uh, cycles. And of course, uh, this is uh, kind of much stronger requirement because if it's uh, no homologous, generally no homologous is going to be especially no homologous, pushing forward zero to zero, right? Uh, but it turns out we do not need such a strong requirement, right? And so we also get uh, the glory uh, of linear pairing between the spectral homology and the homology functions. And much in the same way, now that we've established the homological um, uh, integral formula, one can consider spectral anodyne, and uh, the, uh, we do get a raw series expansion for uh, ecomorphic functions on the spectral uh, on the spectral anodyne. Um, and so we can also consider the not just the uh, ring of um, uh, formal. Um, Laurel series, but also convergent Laurel series, and so considering so uh, so uh, uh, general Laurel series, not the ring, but general. So we allow for infinite principle for infinite principal parts. One can define the residue, uh, and the residue is of course not just at a point, but at a whole equivalence class uh, in in the residue field. So it's a thin subspace, and. The appropriate definition for homomorphic functions is then that this is the space of functions or new that are achomorphic outside of spect spectrally isolated or cylindrically, cylindrically isolated uh, possible singularities with, with final principal parts. And then one can state the residue theorem, it works much in the same way, except we need to excise the whole of in space subspaces uh, that correspond to our possible uh, singularities. Right, and so uh, so some example. So what's what's with the rational functions? What's the analog of rational functions? And uh, of course, we take the power series over t. There is a kind of a special uh, maximal uh, kind of a special prime ideal there. Basically, I call it the hopeless ideal because there is no uh, because there is no basically there is no hope for these for the elements of, of this idea to be some uh, invertible. Uh, and so it makes sense to to to, to define uh, the ring of rational functions over A as the localization of this idea, this prime ideal. And actually, we do get the uh, inclusion of, this, uh, of the rational functions in the form of row series. And so uh, the algebra, uh, so on the side of the algebra, the, the formal row series, both actually the, the formal and the convergent row series. Uh, uh, from the Turing local A algebras with these respective maximal ideas, so generated by them. Uh, so, uh, actually, the, the consisting of the elements with new, new potent uh, coefficients, and the residue fields are simply the, uh, uh, the, 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 the simply the formal and um, the convergent raw series with the principal parts and the complex coefficients. Right, and, and this is a very small example, actually trivial example. So, I mean, for example, if you take two numbers and uh, we have to determine the singular locus of this function, it has very simple uh, uh, solution. So, we get we take a spectral projection and uh, it gives us a, a complex polynomial on variable has complex zero, no, uh, no, and one. And at this point, we do know that uh, the <coughs> This locus of, uh, of non-invertibility invertibility is going to be exactly the, the union. 
of, uh, of, uh, of, of the equivalence classes of 0 and 1, so the union of m and 1 plus m. And this, this is completely trivial, works uh, of course for uh, in much more general setting for, for projections or to some, some um, portion drawings. Uh, right, and we do not need, uh, uh, in fact, uh, we do not need any analytic theory, and it works even though uh, AZ is not an infantilization domain. Uh, but of course, it works more generally for, for, more, for more general monomorphic functions, uh, simply because we know how they extend, and we know that if it has to have a honest singularity, the singularity also has to extend to, to uh, its thin closure, to its, uh, its cylindrical closure. Uh, right, and so let's let's look at zeros now. Let me talk, talk a little bit about singularities. Um, well, zeros can be trickier because we, we do not have this 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 uh, claim correspondence uh, like in a complex plane. We do have we we have so simple non-invertible elements, right? More generally, not just zeros. Um, and so we we can have non-isolated zeros, if we have isolated zeros, and no zeros at all. But singularities, uh, they, they take the edge over the, uh, uh, the zeros in terms of tricky behavior because there is a new type of singular behavior here. So here's, here's the example again in the so-called dual numbers. We get to have two, uh, two uh, Laurent series that are inverse to each other and both have honest poles. This does not happen in the complex plane. Okay? And so I took this an essential pole, you know, because it, it, on the one hand side it is a pole because it has a final principal part, but on the other hand it behaves a little bit like essential singularity, uh, right? Because uh, if, you, if you invert the, the function, you still have this uh, problem. And so the natural question is, uh, can we uh, can we determine when this, this occurs? And uh, so a partial answer to this is. If we define, so we can define the so the, the Laurent degree, uh, so the, the the smallest non, uh, so the smallest degree of on, on vanishing uh, on vanishing coefficient, and there is also a, a kind of evaluation, even though this is not a field, there is a non-Archimedean evaluation on on this on the Laurent series by simply taking the lowest uh, degree such that the corresponding coefficient is invertible. So two different things. And uh, we have to exclude, so we take as a fiber of infinity, we, we, take, we have to take the corresponding hopeless idea again. So, uh, so this is, of course, the, 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 the difference from the field because it's not just zero, but uh, we have to consider all these phonological um, elements. And then the, the partial answer to this is um, so if you have such a function, so it has known as a pole. Uh, so degree of f is uh, negative, and it's, if it is invertible, and here is the important condition: if it, this in the evaluation ring of the Laurent series so it has no negative evaluation, then uh, it does have, uh, in fact, an essential singularity at this point, an essential pole at this point. And there is a remaining, uh, there is a uh, open remaining case, namely when the evaluation is strictly, strictly be between zero and the degree of f. So. And uh, this is uh, this proved to be a little harder than expected, uh, right? And so uh, to, to finish a little bit, so to, so another so another uh, so another step towards uh, more global aspects, as expected, but we've seen that uh, the inverse function theorem um, uh, also works for echomorphic functions, so it works in the category of echomorphicity, and we also get uh, to have the implicit function theorem in much in the same. Way. And so um, here is a, let's say, a definition, a Riemann surface over the algebra A is a connected manifold of um, A dimension 1 with a homomorphic or a bihomorphic transition maps, transition functions. And so here again, argument in favor of keeping the unit in the algebra. Uh, so so some, some examples, for example, if, if you have a full right lattice in, in the algebra, uh, uh, so, so the then uh, the, the, the quotient, which is a torus, uh, logically, uh, will carry an analytic structure simply by pushing forward um, well, the analytic structure of A uh, along the covering map. And another example of such, such spaces uh, comes from uh, the restriction. So, okay, here is a, a bit of logical in a sense, uh, so elliptic curve, uh, but just think of it as a um, some, some algebra, smooth, uh, smooth uh, complex algebraic curve. 
more generally, then you can perform the layer series. So you can extend scalars to, to let's say, the dual numbers. Uh, I, ch I chose the dual numbers here for because it's the simplest non trivial example. And then you can pull back, of course, uh, so, so you can, you can uh, go back to the complex coefficients. And this, uh, this uh, algebraic variety carries, in fact, the uh, dual uh, analytic, so dual complex analytics structure, yes. So analytic structure was CEE. Uh, and in fact, so if, if this works for uh, uh, any variety, uh, if Nx is, uh, is smooth over C as a complex variety, then uh, it's going to be smooth so that this, this procedure is going to produce a smooth variety over A and so also over C. Uh, this is, of course, not true if we replace the complex numbers by, by real numbers. And I think my time is up, and thank you for your attention at this point. I hope it was somewhat interesting. Does it make sense to talk about pseudo convexity, such kind of things? Uh, uh, pseudo convexity, you mean when, when you. Uh, it will make sense if you want to study several algebra variables, I guess. Yeah. And, uh, but there is uh, so Well, there are some things I didn't say, for example, the, the relative point of view. So here, here's the thing so, because uh, ultimately one wants to have the categorical uh, point of view. So if you. Oh, we want to consider morphisms of algebra. So all this is just for identity morphism of the article. You can identify the object with its identity morphism. And if you have, for example, uh, so let's say some 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 diagram. Okay, I'm prepared. <laughs> non permanent. Uh, so let's say you have some such example so you can consider of course uh, because you have a module structures something like that and so basically you can in, in terms of several variables because you're no longer dependent on the choice of um, C so you're not fixed to C you have a lot of freedom and you can consider these things and I have no idea I mean how complicated or simple such a theory would be. Of course, this is a very special case of several complex mm -hmm. variables if you want to, but with much traditional structure. So, yeah. 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 Are there any interesting examples of special functions, for example, hypergeometric functions? Uh, uh, sorry, can you? Uh, are there interesting examples of, uh, for example, things uh, like hypergeometric functions? Uh, well, it's. Uh, uh, well, it, uh, it's. What you get, of course, you, you can get all the, uh, so you can get hyper geometric functions, but with a twist, with a polynomial twist. To that, so so you, you get um, this is what you can uh, what you can do. I saw interesting examples of functions. I think interesting examples of functions. Um, I'm going to get some interesting if you, when we consider, consider this toric or elliptic functions, for example, so uh, elliptic uh, curves. But I, I haven't. Uh, so in terms of um, uh, in terms of uh, spatial functions, I don't think that it is well. In terms of non polynomials, so of honestly analytic. So, so some going to say it. If honestly analytic special functions, I don't think you get more interesting examples than what you already have in the complex plane. So the, the, the interesting part is actually this part in, uh, contained in the maximal ideal, so this non-unital algebra itself. And it, it, it is what produces uh, interesting polynomials that have a, a lot of relations between them. So. Yeah, in a sense, uh, so the, the, the analytic part, honestly, analytic part won't be any more interesting than what we already get from a complex plane, but it will be, so to say, twisted, so to speak, twisted with uh, some interesting polynomials. There's a relation to the point where you can actually do geometry, maybe. Yeah. What about the, the exponent? So, sorry? What about the exponent function? The, the exponent function? Yes. Oh, it's it's a, it's a, it's a easy. Uh, um, I mean, you do have an exponent function, and uh, obviously, it's polynomial. Uh, this it works for any algebra. 
And so in fact, it actually allows you to, uh, um, uh, it, it, it gives you a sort of an uh, isomorphism for the group of units of the algebra, actually. So it's a, like a rational function. Of, of, uh, so it's, uh, it works. I mean, if you if you were asking me if x of uh, so uh, basically an x of matrix, so if you ask me if uh, this holds, yeah, sure, this works. Yeah, no problem. Yeah. Yeah. Do you also recover in this more general context some of the other classes you can conceptualize like Lewis? So, sorry? Do you recover up some other uh, classical results like Lewis theorem? Uh, for example, or you need most, pretty much. I'm, I'm, I'm very confident that you you get uh, pretty, you get uh, pretty much everything you have in okay. in complex analysis and even surfaces uh, with some addition, of course, modifications. Yeah. Or what about the fundamental theorem of algebra? Well, it, it's uh, <laughs> uh, yeah. Obviously, it's not uh, um, so uh, not the case. We saw that you can have so basically, if you have because they're non-trivial. The point is that uh, since A has non-trivial, uh, uh, um, so non uh, has non-trivial uh, uh, um, maximum ideal, uh, you you get uh, you get the non-trivial units of this range. Sure. So so yeah, uh, and. Uh, uh, it, it's not that big of a problem because you can always pass to the residue field to see in this uh, case. Um, so, so in terms of fundamental theorem of algebra, of, uh, algebra for such thing, for such algebras, there is nothing new there. Are so. there special results for division algebras? Uh, for division algebras, you mean for quaternions? Well, this would be a non-commutative case, and um, the, 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 so division algebras are not interesting for me for the reason because well, you, you get uh, from non as a non-division finite dimensional division algebra, you that is uh, not the complex numbers and not the real numbers, you get the quaternions as a real, and uh, it's a Clifford algebra, right? So and there is a whole theory of Clifford analysis, and the thing is you can't. Uh, so this this uh, this idea of with, when, when you have non-commutativity, this idea of uh, appropriating the differential portion does not work any longer. It produces only trivial cases. It produces so you can define from the left. Um, so I know. Um, okay, this is not very You can define the limit from the left, the portion from the left, or a portion from the right. Uh, Right, uh, when this is in this setting, or even if this doesn't matter, you can define from left or from right, but it's all going to be trivial. It's go going to produce only linear functions. And so there is, uh, so when you want to, and so there is a different approach, uh, like Dirac, Dirac operators and such as spin structures and all that uh, for, for, for this setting. Uh, but, but, there is a different way to, to deal with, to, we have to introduce non commutativity in this setting. There is a different way. Uh, and uh, I'll give a very small example. It's possible because it's not. So uh, it's kind of a semi uh, non commutativity, for example, one can consider some, uh, um, this object. So, this kind of thing. So, and uh, this is this. This is also interesting because it also so, so uh, maps of this form also admit shear Riemann equations, except. They are no longer simply differential, linear differential equations. They contain additional operators. And you can do, and the point is, uh, you can also do geometry. What, what can you do geometry with? You need a ring where you can add, multiply, but also compose that is close in the composition, which is, uh, this is, so, so this is one way to introduce 
uh, non-commutativity. Non uh, another way to introduce non-commutativity in a theory um, is by looking at uh, the Kirimann equation, so uh, this more general form. This more general form, and uh, th there is uh, th there is a very funny thing uh, going on uh, with this. So if you, if you, if you uh, consider uh, uh, so systems of partial differential of linear partial differential equations, of first order with constant coefficients, and you want you want such a system to be uh, well. So we do not impose at this moment any any any, any uh, condition on the coefficients. So and if you uh, so let's uh, if you think of these functions as functions so uh, uh, as a functions taking values in this one commutative algebra. So so the dimension must be of course the same. And you impose the condition uh, that the solutions uh, have to be uh, so the solution space so very generic. No no initial conditions nothing. No boundary conditions. Uh, as we close in the composition, then you actually uh, can recover from this the tensor of an associative algebra, basically. So basically, compositions, the closeness on the composition of the system of um, equations corresponds to 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 such a tensor of an associative algebra. And, uh, uh, and uh, I'm not. I don't need then. Uh, I don't need commutativity. I don't assume comm commutativity. So. This way. So this this is another way, but it's not exactly clear to me how. So there is a how what, what's so the coordinate coordinate free uh, formulation of this. So in terms of the algebra structure, so there, there is some some uh, action of the center of the algebra and so on. But um, I, I haven't worked out the details. Are there any other questions? Oh, well, if not, let's take take more.